Hello, everybody. Thank you, uh, Kathy Diwali and Jen, for wonderfully organizing this great uh, day of panels. It's a pleasure and honor to be here today. And it's quite weird that I don't have a computer for a change. <laughs> yes, but we're on. Okay. Can you hear me better? Now? Uh, the International Curatorial Resurgence of Interest in Feminist Art in the Past Decade has sparked an overdue discussion of feminist curating, in line with this nascent exploration of the past of feminist curating to ensure the radicality of its future, this panel suggests considering the role of collaboration and collectivity in feminist curating, bringing together examples of collaborative exhibition making that advances feminist art politics and coll collectives that var variously utilize curating, pushing the boundaries both of feminist curating and politics. Collaboration is, of course, an ingredient of all curating, albeit a highly signatory and not always radical product of the global art market. Yet collaboration and collectivity have been potent tactics of radical feminist curatorial practice from its beginning. They have indeed diversely shaped feminist curating, itself understood not only as radical intervention in the history of curating, but a potentially revolutionizing enactment of feminist politics in art and life. Whether it makes visible the work of female artists or feminist art, Maps it, maps it in time and space and folds the plurality of arts histories, subjectivity and sexuality, etc., 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 feminist curators at its best radically advances, redefines, and enacts feminism in its diversity, feminisms. I purposely substituted, therefore, curating with exhibition making in the title of this panel to defy the brandable authorial resonance and the professional compliance of curators of today by avoiding the radical organizing of exhibitions by groups of artists at the beginning of the feminist movement before its professionalization and institutionalization. And I have only one slide since we had to prepare for this way advanced we knew what we we're gonna say. <laughs> Women House comes, for instance, to mind as a chief historic paradigm, not only of collaborating feminist art practice, but of feminist reconceptualization of exhibition making through collaboration. Several impromptu or long-term co-curatorial partnerships comprise a large chapter of early feminist curating. The knocking Harris paradigm will come up, I guess, today by Mora. Tacit or hard to disentangle, collaboration and collecti collective creation underpin the exhibition history of artist-run galleries and various acti activist initiatives, whether we see the collective organizing of early exhibitions as radical detouring or radical displacement of sexist curatorial practice. Think, for instance, the women artists in revolution saw X to Alvin uh, in 1970, the shows of the AR gallery, uh, or of where we at, um, or even Valley Exports, uh, Magna, the transnational feminist show uh, in 1975, even though it was curated by Valley Exports. But what is a curator, after all, but uh, the head of a collective enterprise? Necessary for large-scale international investigations of women's cultural production, Collaboration continues to play today an important role in feminist curating, both, of course, in its institutionalized uh, and alternative confrontations with institutions of art and society. It is actually uh, often radically reconfigured by interdisciplinary synergies uh, or the current networking possibilities of, of the web and social media. And Joanna Isaac recently has uh, spoken about, uh, uh, about the projects of START in Italy in light of this kind of networking, uh, online networking and co-curating. It is the proliferation of all women, uh, it is however the proliferation of all women curatorial platforms or collectives, whether explicitly feminist or not, that manifests a rekindled belief in the transformed or transformative feminist politics of curatorial collaboration, whether operating in radical art scenes like the, like the DIY art scene of Glasgow, for instance, or various underground margins, Occupying institutional positions of the global art market, like the Istanbul Biennale curated by the Zagreb Collective, uh, what uh, uh, WHW, or enacting transnational feminist politics, as does the Danish Collective Curatorisk Action, and of course, variously combining art activism, curatorship, if not curatorial activism, like the co conspirators of the rid ridiculous Gaia and for the best that uh, who are here with us today. Skepticism is, of course, inevitable. Collaboration today can be seen as a networking tool produced by and serving global capitalism, or a survival tactic ensuing from the precariousness of the art workers with limited potential or viability. Yet when rising from below, 
drawing inspiration from the social movements of the 60s that fueled the recent return to collaboration and activism, collaboration may still hold valuable keys for feminist praxis, including radical curatorial praxis. Collaboration and collective identity have been essential to feminist projects because they produce solidarity between women. While the universalizing early premises of solidarity have been rightly disputed, it is by producing solidarity with heterogeneity that collaboration and collectivity renew their potential as radical tactics of non-hierarchical co-responsibility. And by solidarity with heterogeneity, I mean solidarity based as much on the common differences among women across borders as on the affinities of the oppressed across sexual, gender, national, ethnic, class, religious, and other divides of power that is necessary to fortify the political premises of an updated transnational feminist project that no longer targets only sexism and, and racism, but a variety of intermeshed factors of oppression, including its neoliberal causes. Nevertheless, radical feminist curating cannot yet effectively, effectively perform the transformative, transsexual or transnational politics it inspires today by dispensing its old politics of equality and representation. The current backlash in the representation of women in the art world, manifested by staggering statistics, makes, I think, the legacy of collaboration in feminist curated, as curating as present as ever for the effective fighting of the old and new feminist battles by feminist curating. But we're here to learn from the experiences of those who have enacted feminist curatorial collaborations or have reshaped and expanded the feminist curatorial project through collective efforts with disparate investment in feminist activism, art, and exhibition making. And by this, I would like to call my first speaker to the podium, Dr. Maura Riley. Um, a founding mind of the Feminist Art Project, uh, welcome here, and a fellow graduate from the Institute of Fine Arts of New York University, Maura Riley is a New York-based curator, again, I should say, after several years at the Sydney University, an arts writer, and an arts writer who has dedicated her career exclusively to contemporary visual culture in or, or from the margins. As founding curator of the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum, she's the curator of the first exhibition and public programming space in, the US, in a US museum devoted exclusively to feminist art. In addition to many exhibitions at the Brooklyn Museum, including the reinstallation of Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, she has curated several independent projects, such as Carol Schneeman painting what it became at BPOW Gallery to pick one of an impressive list. She has authored and edited numerous books and articles, and the most recent are the much-awaited uh, uh, women artist, the Linda Nocklin Reader, uh, and the forthcoming curatorial activism towards an ethics of curating, both by Thames and Hudson. Rayleigh is the recipient of several prestigious awards, including Art Table's Future Women Leadership Award and a Lifetime Achievement Award for, from the Women's Caucus for Art. An advocate of feminist curating as activism, <coughs> Riley is here to speak about the, her curatorial collaboration with Linda Nocklin for the critically acclaimed show, Global Feminism. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly O'B. Make sure I'm speaking in the mic. Well, as a New Yorker, I tend to be so loud, I don't even need a mic. Right, I know, I know. I'm just teasing. Um, thank you for having me. It's, it's an absolute delight. And thank you for that generous introduction. So, as the founding curator of the Sackler Center for Feminist Art, in March 2007, I was responsible for launching three major exhibitions, the permanent installation of Judy Chicago's The Dinner Party, a small exhibition which often gets overlooked, the Pharaohs, Queens, and Goddesses, which also launched at that time, which is a small exhibition looking at powerful women from Egyptian history, and global feminisms, all of which were curatorial collaborations. But for this paper, as I've been asked to do by Calliope, I'll focus exclusively on the latter global feminisms, which was a collaborative and a collective endeavor. And I think, um, you know, I think the collective is, is probably one of the most important aspects of this that uh, often doesn't go discussed. So I'd like to emphasize that as well as I go through this talk. So the 
Exhibition Global Feminisms was a joint enterprise of two women, one younger, myself, and one older, Linda Nochlin, who's the Lila Atchison Wallace Emerita Professor of Modern Art at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. Now, our relationship was secured not only by our co-curatorship of the show Global Feminisms, but by our long personal history of common intellectual pursuits and feminist passions, but also by uh, the fact that as a doctoral student of Professor Linda Nochlin, the show then was the product of what one might call an intergenerational feminist and or a matrilineal approach to exhibition making. Now, I decided to invite Linda Nochlin to co-curate the inaugural exhibition for a number of reasons. The first being, the most obvious, is her immense reputation as one of the world's leading experts in feminist art of the past and the present. So since the publication of her landmark essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists in 1971, she's published countless texts on the subject of feminism and women in art, as well as feminist analyses of the male canonical artists. But further, as my long-term mentor and dear friend, I knew that she would be an ideal collaborator. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly in relation to global feminisms, the opening of the center in 2007 coincided with the 30-year anniversary of another exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, also organized by Linda Nochlin with Anne Sutherland Harris, and that was the landmark exhibition Women Artists 1550 to 1950 that we just saw a slide of, which traveled to the museum in 1977 and represented the first large-scale museum exhibition in this country dedicated to women's artistic production, and again, another collaborative and collective effort. Now, by far the most significant curatorial corrective in the 1970s to the occlusion of women as cultural contributors from the larger historical record, the exhibition's central aim was the reclamation of women artists and their insertion back into the traditional canon of art history from which they had been lost or forgotten or misplaced and dismissed as insignificant because female. Now, the exhibition, again, I'm talking about women artists, the one in 1977, presented more than 150 works by 84 painters, from 16th century miniatures to modern abstractions, an enormous exhibition and one that can't be underestimated. Now, an inherently feminist project that challenged not only the masculinist canon of art history, but it also challenged the history of museum exhibition practices that helped sustain it for centuries. No one questioned in 1976 and 77 why the exhibition focused solely on artists from America and Europe, with only one artist of color, Frida Kahlo, in the exhibition. Now, it was understood at that time by Nochlin and Sutherland Harris that that was their chosen object of analysis. The academic canons of art history, literature, philosophy, and so on were being challenged by feminists at the time for their masculinist tendencies, not necessarily for their Eurocentric ones. That would come a decade later in the 1980s. So from its inception, global feminisms defined itself in counterpoint to that specific pioneering exhibition. Let me explain that a little bit further. Like women artists, global feminism was a large scale exhibition, 88 artists from 65 countries, to date the largest exhibition of international art to be presented at the Brooklyn Museum. But unlike women artists, however, which ended its examination with the year 1950, prior to the women's liberation movement and the development of feminism, that is to say, global feminisms looked at contemporary work produced by artists for whom the heritage of feminism has long been part of the cultural fabric. Now, moreover, whereas women artists, again, was working within and again a Western canon of art history, even as it questioned the so-called master narrative, global feminisms looked specifically beyond the borders of Euro-America in order to challenge what it argued is still a Eurocentric art system. So situated as they were, the two exhibitions served as conceptual bookends, separated by 30 years of feminist artistic practice and theory, along with post-colonial and anti-racist theory. Linda and I were both convinced that only a major exhibition of woman artists was appropriate for the opening of the center. And we wanted to signal the pioneering enterprise of the center, its historic import, by, foc by focusing its first show around younger women artists and work done since 1990, which is to say, since artists um, that were born mostly post-1960. 
and thereby looking to the present and the future rather than the past. And we wanted, above all, to make the show transnational in the fullest sense of the word, word rather than emphasizing the contribution of European and American artists. So for instance, there were only four American artists out of 88. Now, just as an aside, I think this is a kind of phenomenal um, kind of uh, just nod towards Linda Nochlin's uh, just brilliance that she's able to really look inward and be very self-critical of earlier projects. So she was really recognizing that that earlier project had been limited in its kind of global scope. And so she was able to really kind of embrace that and try to create a project that herself she knew was working um, to sort of correct what she viewed to be an oversight. So I mean, just part of, I think, her brilliance that she's able to recognize and own that. So the aim of the show was really suggested by its title, Global Feminisms, the most <laughs> probably boring title we could have come up with. Um, although there have been exhibitions and, and women artists and indeed feminist shows before that had looked at you know, international areas of feminist artistic production, none of them had really been as ambitious as this one. So by making feminism a plural noun, we meant to imply that there is not a single unitary, def unitary excuse me, feminism any more that there is a timeless universal woman, but rather that there are varied, multiple, unstable constructions of female objects and subjects and their predicaments and situations. So in other words, the concept of difference, which is up on the screen, I think on the left you can get a sense of, um, lay at the heart of the project as a positive factor, not just the difference between men and women, but even more the common differences, as Calliope talked about, among women themselves, differences between women from non-Western cultures and European and American women, and just as interesting and important, differences among women artists within and between cultures, races, ethnicities, classes, and so forth. So we didn't expect, for instance, women from Bolivia or, or Pakistan to exhibit specific ethnic traits in their art any more than we expect, expected the same from women from the United States. And I think to do so would have been very naive and, and patronizing. So we were open to and very interested in uh, the varying and innovative ways that women from diverse parts of the world self-consciously deployed the visual culture they had inherited to create new, often critical visual expressions. So here's part of the collaboration. To, to speak to that. The works we chose for the exhibition were informed by previous knowledge, obviously as feminist art historians, extensive research, and tons and tons of travel. In the summer of 2005, Linda and I traveled, and again, she was probably in her late 70s at that point, actually almost close to 80. Linda and I traveled together throughout Europe, Europe <clears throat> meeting with countless artists, many of whom had migrated from far-flung regions to Europe in order to escape precarious socio-cultural political situations. People like Michelle Magima, who had fled from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, or Latifa Ekak from Morocco, and so on. In the lead up to the opening, I also researched artists by traveling to Poland, Japan, Chile, Mexico, Australia, and other places to perform first-hand first -hand research and studio, vi studio visits, excuse me, and meet with scholars and curators to discuss the project, again, part of the collective nature of global feminisms. But above all, it was the dialogue between ourselves as curators and with other advisors throughout the world that had the broadest impact on our decision making in regards to works in the exhibition. So in an effort to work against the negative stereotype of the curator as explorer, or worse, a neocolonialist, we sought instead to pursue our goal of mounting a global exhibition by positioning ourselves as, quote, mediators of cultural exchange. And that's Gerardo Mosqueras' phrase. In other words, from the outset, we turned to specialists outside our areas of expertise and really admitted our own limitations. So when we initially sat down to brainstorm the show, for instance, we were struck by how little we knew about feminists working outside of Europe and North American contexts. So while our knowledge of an international contemporary feminist art was fairly extensive, there were large regions of the world whose artistic production we were completely unfamiliar with. So as the so-called experts in the field, we never the, nevertheless could not say what feminist art looked like in, let's say, Jakarta or Kinshasa or Guatemala City or Santiago. That bothered us. Did the women identify themselves as feminists there? Were there recurring issues that women were interested in transculturally? 
where women in different countries at various stages of feminist consciousness and where such differences reflected in their work. These were some of many questions that we posited. To answer these and other questions, we realized that we had to not be afraid of the unfamiliar and to keep rethinking what it must mean to be a woman in radically different sociocultural, political, racial, and class situations. At the same time, we recognize that any attempt to provide a single constrictive definition of feminism would be absolutely fatal to our project. The multiple meanings of feminism, we realize, would arrive in situation, to borrow an existential locution, and indeed, they did. With each individual work, each artist, we provided the basis for exploring them in context, not as some abstract general concept. Now here's more about the collective nature of it. I've talked about the collaboration a bit. We knew too from the outset that we wanted to start first with those artists less known on the international art scene. Is it 10 minutes? It's possible. Oh, okay, okay, I'll be really quick. I have two more, par two more yeah, paragraphs. Be, be, be prepared to wrap up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in order to learn, um, we sought the assistance and participation of numerous specialists and local advisors from around the world, including scholars and curators and theorists and artists, using the internet as a primary source and mode of communication. Um, they offered suggestions for artists to look at, so specialists like Rosa Martinez and Gita Kapoor and Dan Cameron and Simon Jami, etc. But it is these regional specialists' understanding of the context and local languages within which the works by women were being produced that proved invaluable and broadened the sample base of artists from which to choose, often before we traveled to the region. This critical dialogue of exchange that ensued with this collective of advisors added the necessary breadth to the project as a whole. Now, our experience of working with these global advisors in turn uh, forced us or made us think about and inspired us to invite non-Western um, authors to contribute to the catalog. So indeed, it was only Linda and I that were the American contributors. And again, that was because we believed that it would be presumptuous of us to assume to understand what it means to be a feminist in Thailand or Kenya, for instance. So in essence, we conceptualized the catalog and the exhibition as a polylogue versus a monologue and as an interplay of voices from writers from Costa Rica, India, Japan, Czechoslovakia, Korea, France, and Africa. So in other words, both the show and the catalog embodied what Calliope introduced, which is the concept of solidarity across heterogeneity. So in sum, global feminisms, its exhibition and catalog were collaborative and collective enterprises and ones that I'm particularly proud of. Thank you very much. Representative of the women, thank you. Sorry, thank you more. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not wrapped up with the time. Uh, representative of the Women Artists Collective, Gaia, based in New Jersey. Our next speaker is Gaia's founding director, Doris Casuello. Casuello is an artist, activist, educator, and curator. She teaches art history and media studies at Hunter College, Rutgers University, and New Jersey City University. She has created dozens of exhibitions of emerging artists, helped produce the PS1 WAC Open Studio Artist Tour with Mary Beth Edelson, the 365 Days of Print Residency, and exhibitions with Maya Joseph Gottiner. Her multimedia work explores the intersection of social and political advocacy, media technology, and the politics of gender and art, and has appeared in several art spaces in New York and abroad. Mastermind of the program of Gaia for over a decade, she's also the founding director of the Wonder Women Artist Residency. She will be also joined today by guest star Gaia member Meredith Goncalves. Goncalves is a fine art photographer, multi multimedia artist, and educator. Her work has been exhibited throughout New York and New Jersey, and it deals with issues related to women, labor, and the quotidian routines that shape our identity, both individually and socially. Goncalves holds an MFA from Hunter College in Integrated Media Arts. She's freelance media producer and an adjunct profes uh, professor at Ramapa College, Hunter College, and Rutgers University. Ladies, welcome to the podium. <laughs> Hello, we're so excited to be here. Um, thank you to the Feminist Art Project for bringing us all together. These are like my favorite kind of rooms, um, rooms full of amazing women. Um, so um, I wanna jump in, since you've already heard a bit about us, 
uh, to the collective. Um, Gaia, for those of you that uh, haven't heard of us, um, is a fairly young artist collective. Uh, we're in our 12th year, um, founded um, by um, a group of 10 women, um, and we've remained about a group of 10 women. Of course, we kind of cycle through as collectives do. Um, and we are tackling tons of programming depending on the members of the group of each year. Um, we do approach um, uh, performance art exhibitions. We produce uh, large-scale theater uh, projects, um, smaller readings. We host a director's residency um, annually. And then, of course, we have a, a huge visual arts component um, of which Meredith and I are both um, directing currently. One of the main projects of the visual arts initiatives through the collective, of course, is the shared studio program, uh, which uh, literally puts us all in one big studio, right? So that we're working side by side, um, constantly critiquing each other's work, but also helping each other, um, sharing resources, things like that. And then, of course, we curate together. Um, and so the Wonder Women Residency Project is a project that I began. Uh, it is now in its ninth annual installation, which I cannot believe. Um, but we are um, going to concentrate on the Wonder Women part of the Gaia Collective um, because I think it is a great way to talk about the examples of collaboration but also um, feminist curation that we think comes from collaboration and collectivity. Um, so this uh, image that you're seeing on the screen is from our very first Wonder Women installation, a piece by Stephanie Worthman um, called Pusse Reappear Louder. Um, and uh, the first Wonder Women initiative, uh, or the first Wonder Women residency project was called Subconscious Hero and dealt with ideas of, hero ideas of heroism um, and inner heroism. Um, one thing that we, uh, that the Wonder Women residency focuses on is a thematic vision. So every year I choose a co-curator um, and then together we work on a thematic vision, together we work on a call an open call. Uh, the project is curated from a, a call for proposals. So we choose 10, again 10, uh, 10 women artists from proposals that they submit um, that lend itself to the conversation around the theme that we've outlined in the call. And so this, this first year was heroism. Um, and we'll, we'll hear about a lot more themes. Um, the residency itself is a six week um, essentially a six-week course, right, where the women come together and learn from each other. Um, and the curator, the co-curator and I, um, act more as facilitators, ultimately, than uh, curators. So we choose the artists, uh, and then we, we put all of the artists in a room once a week for six weeks uh, for critique session and sort of like progress reports. Um, and so uh, the structure is very fast-paced. Um, six weeks is a short amount of time to create an exhibition-ready project, but that's exactly what we ask for. Um, and then within three months of the, of the residency beginning, we have a full exhibition, um, a, a full, a full co cohesive exhibition installed. Um, let's go forward. So the way you, you I love you. Okay, sorry. Uh, just one more thing. Just um, this is the second installment of, of Wonder Women, uh, an exhibition that was called the residency and exhibition were called Mother of God, um, and the theme uh, in this case was approaching conversations about religion and women's role uh, and representation in religion, um, and touching upon motherhood, of course, through the idea of uh, Christianity and the Mother of God. Um, in Christianity, a sort of a Judeo-centered conversation, and then, of course, much more broadly, uh, who the mother of God might be. Um, you can imagine that um, we expanded way past um, Christianity in that conversation. Um, so where this sort of practice intersects with what, oh, sorry. Where this practice sort of intersects with third wave feminism is we try to look at, or contemporary feminism, and try to look at issues that are more intersectional. So we're looking at migration, we're looking at larger political movements. Um, here, this is from World War III, and the idea that possibly the next world war would be over water, or this piece actually reflects on it, how it could possibly be over water, where, um, and resources. And so we try to look and choose themes that 
are more intersectional and um, that women can address from a number of different uh, directions. And so we look at how war, in, for example, here, and the social, political, economic, and ecological implications could possibly um, speak to the work that is made during this process. In addition, we like to look at issues like immigration, global migration, sexual violence, and feminist manhood, um, all terms that are sort of within this sort of contemporary framework of third wave feminism. Um, within this cycle, we're talking about superfood. So we're talking about not only our mediated diets that sort of come from this mass media framework, but also what it does to local and um, local economies when something like quinoa gets donned a superfood and what that does on the social and political implications on the local economies which produce those foods. Um, and so we came into this idea, both being new mothers ourselves, this idea of superfood, we came at it from a nursing and pumping at work and um, food system sort of angle, yet none of the artists went with it, with that angle. They were looking at more like, once again, water. They're looking at um, how food cultivation happens. They're looking at food as nurturing. They're looking at food as identity, both politically and um, Person. personally. So the image here was, of, uh, as I mentioned, about the resource of war um, and how in the, this third year of Wonder Women that it reflects on the global impacts and women's role in the, and, oh, I'm moving forward. Um, this piece, which is more of a interactive relational aesthetics piece that was um, shown in the gallery when the sh exhibition was first up. Um, here we have John McLean from Die Hard. She's running a campaign for him. Um, and it's this idea of women's role in the spectacle of American politics. And so all of the work sort of reflects on women's role, although it's not necessarily women, women art about women, each piece. Um, just as an, a side note, the piece you just saw was a piece by the artist Polly Barden. Um, and this is the artist uh, Mary Jays, who's um, a Brooklyn artist. Um, this piece is by an artist named Maya Joseph Gutiner, who has also participated, um, and Ferris knows her very well, um, who has also participated as a co-curator of the Wonder Women Residency. Um, and she and I have collaborated several times, um, and I would um, love it if she didn't live in DC and lived here still. Um, but this was a piece, the first time that Maya and I worked together, she was a resident of uh, the Wonder Women Project as an artist and uh, created um, this piece also about war, a crowdsourcing piece where she created an interactive uh, experiential site-specific installation um, and she had sourced all of these incredible books with war in the title uh, and then asked um, participants or, or gallery visitors to experience the library and then um, contribute uh, ideas about war on those cards that you see. So again, kind of creating this collaborative piece. Um, Oh, uh, okay, just so going quickly, this is um, a, a sort of an idea of us gathered around, sort of listening to each other. Um, so one thing that's very important to us is that the artists help each other and work from each other's um, sort of like vast pools of knowledge. Uh, and the co-curator and I every year um, really act to give them our vision um, but just give them resources in order to complete the project. Of course, steering always towards that idea of the final cohesive exhibition, which we ultimately put together in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, and this is a group of uh, women in the Mother Ah Motherland uh, exhibition, which was about immigration and identity politics. Um, this is a, a, a piece at ABC No Rio by an artist named Michelle Lachlan, um, a New Jersey-based artist. Uh, this is called uh, Money, 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 which was in 2009 responding to the economic crises that were happening. Um, it was not a coincidence that it was at ABC No Rio, who at that time was going through a massive capital campaign to save the building and ultimately renovate um, this landmark of the arts, which you know at the time that so many of these landmarks had been disappearing um, and uh, resources for artists kind of uh, going with them. Um, so the venue that we choose for the exhibition is always very crucial because the same way that we kind of exist outside of the institutional model of curating and art making, we also choose venues that are working with the same mission. So ABC No Rio, of course, kind of existing outside of the institutional model. Again, a close up of Michelle Lachlan's piece, which is about foreclosures and ownership. Okay. Um, uh, this is a collaborative installation. 
where should I go? A, a piece uh, about immigration and identity. Um, and this piece, uh, a little bit more about it. The artist, she created these wood-burning portraits of women, immigrant women and the roles that they inhabit in their workspace. Incidentally, this whole body of work that she created, all of the women were also single mothers, so they were also heads of household as well. So recur lots of recurring themes. So a lot of things end up having double meanings once the artist starts working through their process. Um, and so from this, uh, the residency on Motherland, we tackled these, these issues of immigration and migration, um, but we also try to take the residency internationally. Um, and so we uh, start to talk about, uh, sorry if you gave me the wrap up, so then I got all yeah, distracted, wrap, sorry. Wrap up everything <laughs> we've ever done. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so uh, do you want to talk about Cypress? Sure. And uh, the, so uh, w a big push now, of course, of the Wonder Women Residency, as, as Maura Riley also spoke to, is this idea of uh, international feminisms and really thinking about outside of our sort of New York, New Jersey, or at least uh, US-based experience, what does it really mean to, to talk about feminist politics? Um, and uh, in a way that we try to diversify the group of women that work in the residency, we've gone beyond that and now have started to collaborate with international um, sort of women's artist collectives uh, and groups. Um, and our first international collaboration was in 2011 with the residency New News is Old News, which looked at a changing media landscape. Uh, and we went to Cyprus, which of course is a place kind of in turmoil with its own sort of political identity issues. Um, and we worked with both Turkish and Cypriot artists. We took some New York artists over and then worked with uh, Cypriot curators and Cypriot artists to create an additional dialogue. So we recreated the Wonder Women residency there and then brought Cypriot artists back to Brooklyn to the Gowanus Art Studio space. And that's something we want to keep doing. And, and I guess that's ultimately our last point is that um, we have uh, an initiative now during the Superfood Residency, which is the current installation of Wonder Women. We're right in the middle of the meetings, so it's kind of a really exciting time. Um, and so Superfood will be on exhibition at Gallery of Pharaoh, which you saw a slide of, um, which is a women-run gallery in Newark, New Jersey, also a place in transition uh, and a place where the arts is uh, certainly something that we're looking at and highly involved in. Um, and at a pharaoh uh, on April 11th, we'll be opening the Superfood Exhibition, which feels like tomorrow. Um, but we'll be opening the Superfood Exhibition, and then we're looking to fundraise, we're in the middle of fundraising, for the Superfood Residency to continue in Porto, Portugal, uh, in August. So very quickly happening. So if anyone would like to hear more information or help support that effort, um, you know, come up and talk to us. We have some cards and stickers because we love a sticker. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I was actually really complimentary uh, if you think about uh, different kinds of uh, curatorial and transnational legs work. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Doing more than them. Our next uh, speaker is A.L. Steiner, the founding half of the actual curatorial collective, Ridiculous. Steiner utilizes constructions of photography, video installation, collage, collaboration, performance, teaching, writing, and curatorial work as seductive tropes channeled through the sensibility of a skeptical, queer, eco-feminist androgyny. <laughs> Steiner has a very good relationship with the co-prefix, I guess, uh, is a member of Chicks on Speed, co-founder of Working Artists and the Greater Economy, I wage, and collaborates with numerous visuals and performing artists. She is visiting assistant professor at the University of Southern California, California, an MFA faculty at Bart College in New York. Her work is featured in such permanent colle collections as the Brooklyn Museum of Art, Mary Louise Hassel Collection, and the Museum of Modern Art. Steiner's work will be featured in Los Angeles this summer at Bloom and Poe, and she has been chosen as a 2016 and 17 Fellow of the American Academy in Berlin. And there we go. We do have your title on the screen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Stan. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> yes, there you go. That was more personal. I forgot. I'm here as ridiculous. So um, <laughs> I'm just going to start and then um, speaking and then. I'll show some slides. 
I hope I pressed the right button. I was told not to not to press a certain button. There we go. Okay, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, yeah, this is there. Okay, good. Um, thanks for the invitation and for organizing this um, to everyone. So it's feminist cure hating and feminist curating as lived practice, practicum of practice and praxis. <clears throat> Got it. Fantastic. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> um, clearly, the project deals a lot with language. This uh, presentation will confront and dissect the notion, perception, and field of study notated under the auspices of feminism, feminist scholarship, femanism, and feminisms. Ridiculous is a collective effort on the part of myself and Nicole Eisenman to subvert the theoretical, performative, textual, and visual languages which are com commonly used to define feminist, in quotes, or lesbian art. Ridiculous purports to distill a cultural moment or tap into the blood and guts of an underground movement. However, Ridiculous seeks the erosion of such conceits and the attendant limitations placed on a culture forced to operate as an alternative rather than a viable contributor to the con conversation at large. Ridiculous constructs a counter narrative that no longer adheres to the rules and definitions of either approach. Engaging with both traditional and art historical positions of the female subject and the modern commodification of female artists and their work. Ridiculous will tell you everything and nothing and plunge you into an abyss of fury. Ridiculous is a confrontational melange of recipes, poems, celebrity interviews, facts, fictions, accusations, jokes, sex, advice, merchandise, violence, puzzles, and luxurious artworks available and unavailable for your home. If you are one of those people questioning what is happening on planet Earth, the women with a Y, or the letter Y, or W-H-Y, or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> of Ridiculous, and a few of our male identified, male with a Y as well, um, identified <laughs> frenemies purport to have the answer. We will meet your requirements and surpass your expectations, allowing us to serve you better. Um, just a few more minutes. Help, uh, hang on with me, people. Um, Ridiculous is angry and everything is wrong. <laughs> Ridiculous has most recently taken notice of the conceits of feminist curators and scholars who profess an individualist, supremacist, and conceited notion of both the language and framework of art and writing. These most evident and recent conceits arise in context to late capitalists, capitalizations, and financializations. <laughs> Tendencies which envelop, co-opt, and close, and subvert all notion of liberation into new business-based models of disruption in the experience economy. I hear some snapping. <laughs> These enclosures leave no time or space to fall outside of a profitized marketplace, one of free speech and open thought. Knowledge is transformed into lived practice, or it is nothing at all, other than coded, semiotic, quantifiable information from which to profit in this culture as Ridiculous knows it. Both arts-based and feminist communities arise out of the ashes of lived practices, living and thinking together without a, directive, a direct form of dictatorial, dictatorial with a CK, <laughs> um, autocracy or patriarchal hierarchy. As we all know, there are, these are issues on the national stage concerning academia, the completed co-optation co of knowledge into profitized industries, a corporatized co-optation of what was once perceived as the humanities. Stylized, specu uh, spectacularized suppression and oppression of our minds, bodies, and our intangible, ridiculous little human souls in exchange for metrics, obedience, and a pseudo-meritocracy, dulled out by failed technocrats in a haze of empty promises. Yes, yes, we're still angry. Worship worshippers of power for power's sake. As ha Jack Halberstam wrote in The Queer Art of Failure, the history of alternative political formations is important because it contests social relations as given and allows us to access traditions of political action that, while not necessarily successful in the sense of becoming dominant, do offer models of contestation, rupture, and discontinuity for the political present. Almost done. The so-called tech and business communities of the 21st century have adopted the language of 20th century artists, writers, inventors, and collectivizers, such as the Invisible Committee's Situationist, Octavia Butler, Simone de Beauvoir, you know, whatever, whoever, everyone. Um, <laughs> Samuel Delaney, whatever. And countless uh, other of society's <laughs> queers and have bastardized these languages as a form of proto-fascist thinking outside the box. A shallow concept based on a mistaken notion of chaos which is simply set up to propel a superficial, hatriarchal cesspool of chaos, confusion, and theft. 
We're in that silly, predictable apocalypse drama where the enemy within us was and is always just steps away. Voices snatched and disappeared in hierarchical structures where dissent and resistance is but some bandied about delusion <coughs> of powerless side note with mandatory austerity and useless committee charges. The voice, um, I'm still angry, of course. <laughs> the voice is a machine for thinking and feeling. Yes, the side note, uh, so, sorry. Yes, the planet is compromised of feelings and very deep ones. Many institutional curators and feminist academics are blindly, sorry, that's fem feminist with a man in the middle. <laughs> academics are blindly following pa a pathway to hell without feeling and hearing the human voice. Sarah Lawrence's student, um, Jesse Brenneman, said in his school's magazine, quote, how do we balance the powers of our intellect, our temptation to categorize and reduce and quantify everything in its logically proper box with the beautiful reality of our messy, undefinable life? Qu question mark. Jesse, I offer you ridiculous. Um, I don't know, I don't think he's here, but I should invite him. Um, there is nowhere else. We do recruit and we are self-exiled. Ridiculous declares war on the spoils of a cringy crisis capitalism, or capitalism, sorry, crap. <laughs> <laughs> we put the human back in humanities. We have no committees and we don't believe in equal equality with patriarchal society on planet money. We're seeking other worlds and we don't compromise. We're not single issue curators because as Audre Lorde said, we do not live single issue lives. If you have a problem with us, we don't care. We believe in chance, but mostly while we're presenting here at CAA, we believe in putting your scholarship where your mouth is. Let Ridiculous be your bullshit detector if you, can, if you can't seem to locate one yourself. We deal in brutal honesty, and our tagline is bring your own, B-Y-O-M, bring your own mirror, so we can draw your shame. We curate with an iron fist. I'll end with a poem by Dr. Lori Weeks, one of our often, uh, well, board, uh, she's the chair of our board of directors. Um, this was published in our 2006 tome, Ridiculous, the zine, our only zine. Um, okay, here's the poem. Dear late capitalism, I hate you. You make everything boring and ugly. I feel abject and powerless. I hate that I can't leave the house without my cell phone. <laughs> So just, just tell me when the clock is done, because you know this. I think this this slide show is like an hour and a half. So just tell me. <laughs> I'm not um, so this is from um, our exhibit. Thank you. Um, thank you. That was very subtle. Um, <laughs> this is from our uh, most recent exhibit that ended up at the St. Louis um, Contemporary Art Museum and also um, the Philadelphia ICA called Ridiculous, but spelled with R-E-A-D. This and it's all heart. This language, reading, which was angry, angry correspondences or um, emotionally charged pieces. So this was our Serenity plate that we redid. Um, we found it in in St. Louis. Um, this was from our zine. Um, that was that was one of our first collaborative pieces for the project Nicole and I made. Um, and this was the cover of the two, 2006 zine. People still want the next zine. There is no next zine, so don't hang around waiting for it. Um, <laughs> but that was the cover with Suzanne Wright, um, did that uh, drawing choo-choo, and that was Lori Weeks, her cover line. You know, she was our editorial director. Um, these were some pieces. This is Shane's fist. I don't know, the L word was really influential in the development of Ridiculous, um, and also the zine. And this is Shane's playlist. Drawing Shane's inner shame or outer shame. I mean, <laughs> anyway, whatever. She ended up, Shane ended up with the drawing, which is good, cool. Um, this was Brian St. Sears, Motherfuckers, and um, Janine Olson, and then a little, cute little collage I did. Um, that's Kate Hardy and Christian Lemmertz. Christian Lemmertz did uh, this piece, Charles Sachi's Dick, which was brought to us by uh, one of our funders of the zine, um, Leo Koenig, and then that's Kate Hardy's money shot. Um, <laughs> This is the back cover of the zine. Those were all the inter some of the internal pages. Um, that was a quote that by Nadie, uh, Katie Nolan that we figure she would have said. And <laughs> this is um, a, a painting by Kathy Burkhart, um, if people know Kathy's work. This was the opening of the first exhibit by Ridiculous and a performance by Dean Diderico, who's now the, one of the curators at the museum in Houston. Um, anyway, people having fun. You know, We were into that proto-fascist period, of course. Um, that we're now steeped in the midst of. 
Um, this was at Participant Inc. in 2007, I think. Um, this was a piece we did with, um, we didn't do it with the Gorilla Girls, but whatever. They ended up really liking it. And, um, <laughs> and we just thought that propelling the conversation forward was really important. Actually, there were, there were a couple of feminists who were really angry about this, which is great, because we are also angry. But they were angry um, in, a, in a different way. So it, it was good. It, wor it totally worked, put it that way. Um, <laughs> And uh, the odds are against us was a, we made a panel table for the panel discussion. That was what the panel was um, with various, you know, things going on in between. It took about whatever, three hours. Um, that was one of our, you know, Bridget, oh, um, uh, what's, um, the, yeah, someone help me with that. Yeah, Bridget Berlin. We, we stole her idea, of course. I don't know. You know, and this was, this was a coming out party for Elizabeth Payton because she was gay again. She actually sent a cease and desist order for our cocktail party that was going to be at the cubby hole. Um, I mean, the gal her gallery sent a cease and desist order. Um, I mean, we still had the drinks. Actually, the paint and tinkle, if you ask them at the cubby hole for the paint and tinkle, they may not know what you're talking about, but that was, that was the drink that we made it on. Um, and, oh, this was another Bronx Museum. Uh, we, well, we did a, yeah, we did a, a bunch of projects. One, uh, that, that looks really, really cool on you was a sculpture we built that was a sculpture of Paris Hilton, Gertrude Stein, and Alice B. Toklas all fused together as one object. Um, <laughs> this was the invitation. This was, this was the building of the sculpture. Again, we're process-based, uh, clearly, in some, of the, in some of our presentations. Um, at least, it, you know, whatever, so. So um, I guess, yeah, the, the projects continue and you, can, you kind of get a, a, uh, a feel for it. And we pretty much take any offers. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll listen to any offers. We don't accept all of the offers. But um, we hope that you contact us soon um, with all of your amazing ideas that we can steal and then process into our own <laughs> work. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you, Steiner. It's apparent that I'm going to end up putting my scholarship in my mouth, and that's <laughs> why <laughs> uh, I needed this uh, uh, talk also to foreground issues and challenges. Our last speaker today is Kate Watkins, a founding member of the Feminist Collective for the Birds. Watkins is a Brooklyn-based writer, curator, and artist who believes in the transformative power of punk. Her recent clients and partners include Mokma Piesuan, International Parenthood Federation, and Overhead, a sound recording application. Kate Watkins is a columnist for the Lesai and has been published in Women in Performance, a journal of feminist theory, Maximum Rock and Roll, Hyperallergic, and various others, other internet and print media. Welcome, uh, and uh, I'm sorry we don't have your partner, co-conspirator today, <laughs> Lauren Denizio, we were supposed to have uh, another speaker, which is on a, pan, uh, on a music tour. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that up. That was amazing. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to thank everyone who's participating, everyone who's here, Kelly Opie, for organizing this panel. Um, I also just wanted to start um, by making sure that everyone knows Lauren and I are actually not active members of For the Birds Collective anymore. We are founding members, um, but the collective has gone on to work on other projects, and Lauren and I are not um, actively involved. So anything that I speak about is a past experience and a past iteration of the collective. So um, I just don't want it to reflect on what the collect current collective and current iteration of the collective is working on. Um, one thing that I also wanted to just take note of was how awesome it is that we are all in this continuum and all the things that we're talking about have um, resonance. Um, Gaia curated something at ABC in Rio in 2009 and actually one of the events, the big shebang, that For the Birds curated um, occurred there the year before. So we're, we're all working uh, within a similar context. So I'm going to read a little bit to give you all a working knowledge about what the collective does and how we position ourselves, well, how Lauren and I positioned ourselves within curatorial praxis within the collective. Um, and then I'm kind of going to jump away from that and try to um, 
just quickly move this along and, and uh, you know, leave room for questions. It is not enough to merely call oneself a feminist. Feminisms must be acted and performed. As a collective for the birds constructs feminist identity via performance. If it is possible to build one's gender via a stylized repetition of acts in Judith Butler's terms, then we believe a feminist identity can be accomplished through similar repetition. The way that activist groups employ actions determines the reality of their political and social identities. In this vein, for the Birds Collective's performative acts occur within the context of feminist culture. In this discussion, we will connect the performance of feminist identity to the way in which gender identity is also performed. Okay, great. In her essay, Performative Acts and Gender Constitution, Judith Butler suggests that gender is constituted through a stylized repetition of acts. These acts build an illusion of a gendered self that is exterior to any preordained internal identity. We consider Butler's notions of constituting identity as similar to the way that we enact and build feminist identity. The appearance of feminist identity can be linked to what Butler calls a performative accomplishment which the mundane social audience, including the actors themselves, come to believe and to perform in the mode of belief. The performative acts we are referring to here in the context of radical culture come in the form of events, posters, zines, videos, and direct activist actions. In the conclusion of her essay, Butler expresses the need to discern the conditions of oppression which issue from an unexamined reproduction of gender identities which sustain discrete and binary categories of man or woman. Through curation of cultural happenings, prints, zines, and art exhibits, for the birds aim to create spaces alternative to those conditions and unexamined reproductions, thus questioning and opposing patriarchy that sustains the gender binary. So another thing that I wanted to throw out there um, is that for the birds is actually not um, an, just an artist collective. It was formed as an activist collective primarily. and. Um, Basically, we're working within something for us that constituted what we call DIY, as in do-it-yourself, feminist cultural activism. So for us, curating events, art shows, and information um, was our activism. So this is the mission statement and a little bit more about the collective. Throughout our work in the collective, we observed unconscious reproductions of sexism, transphobia, racism, and similar internalized biases from many members of radical communities. By curating events, zines, and art exhibitions, for the birds created alternative spaces in order to question and oppose structural patriarchy and other axes of oppression. Internally, for the birds also created processes to regularly address accountability within the collective. These actions were a direct response to the continued existence of oppression within activist and punk communities. It is too often that issues go unresolved under the false assumption that revolutionary automatically equals feminist. With this in mind, hold on a second. Oh, there we go. With this in mind, our activist and curatorial structures or our performance of feminist identity has been a vehicle for us to collectively build a feminist reality. So the next slides are just some examples of uh, the things that we've curated. We come from a music scene founded in a love of punk rock music, a genre that has been overwhelmingly male-dominated and white-dominated since its inception in the 1970s. Now, I don't believe that as like a blanket statement. It's more of those are the people who are given a voice within the scene. Um, there's always been involvement by people of color, queer people of all genders uh, in punk. It's just who, who's given the history. As feminists, we have built communities around punk and queered it, creating safer spaces for women, queer and trans people, hoping to cultivate an alternative to mainstream oppressions. Unfortunately, subculture is rarely ever free of mainstream cultural ideology. Through our experiences in the New York City do-it-yourself or DIY punk feminist community, we have discovered that learning how to communicate effectively on whatever level is what produces the cultural change we want. It means changing the way we think by listening to each other, expanding our cultural vernacular, and bringing previously marginalized voices to the forefront of a new narrative. The communication was an integral part of creating our own safer space within the collective, as well as in our public presence, whether at events or online, and it even, it even guided the contents of our distro. Um, so when I use the term safer space, it's basically to denote um, the idea of creating a space that subverts mainstream oppression. For the Birds formed in the wake of another collective, the Long Island Women's Collective, who established an event called the Big Shebang. The Shebang represented the collective's goals to highlight and encourage girls' and women's voices. It included a full day of activity, vendors, tablers, and a DIY flea market, 
speakers and presenters, and art show and musical performances. After an integral organizer of the Women's Collective, Jody Tilton, passed away due to complications related to Crohn's disease and colitis, a few original members of the Women's Collective decided to throw the big shebang once more in Jody's spirit during the summer of 2008, and that was at ABC No Rio, as I said before. We connected with the feminists in our punk scene in New York to begin brainstorming. These included fellow ex-members of the Women's Collective, as well as new women who played in bands, made art, and were involved in various types of social justice work. After our first shebang in New York City, the organizers of the event committed to a fully active feminist agenda. In October 2008, we chose the moniker for the birds and wrote a mission statement with dreams to collect and disseminate feminist information, zines, books, art, pamphlets, music, and media in general via a feminist distro, an informal and do-it-yourself, essentially nonprofit system of distribution. This is what entailed cultural activism to us as well as booking women-centric music shows, art shows, and literary events, writing about local feminist happenings and current events on our blog, and connecting with other New York City activist groups. During my involvement, For the Birds Collective process echoed that of my own. We aimed to take the best of the feminist movements before us, but leave the rest or what didn't work in the past. We were influenced by Riot Girl, and we intended to take what we loved about punk, more egalitarian modes of production, skill sharing, and resistance to the mainstream oppressions, and leave the rest. We wanted to take something rooted in punk and make its tools available to other marginalized communities. We wanted to connect with other groups that have employed and continue to employ these DIY modes of making, regardless of each other's subcultural affiliations. Um, a good example of a group like that would be Mama's Hip Hop Kitchen, who are going into, I don't even know what year, maybe their sixth or seventh. Um, they operate out of the Bronx, and they have a really amazing um, hip hop festival every year. And that is, uh, I believe, the weekend of International Women's Day. At the heart of For the Birds was our zine distro. Containing over 40 zines, we distributed printed matter on a range of feminist topics, including women's health, safer sex practices, sexual assault, and the intersections of gender, race, and class. The distro also included self-released music compilations of feminist voices along with artwork and other printed ephemera. We tabled at countless events from feminist conferences to DIY feminist punk shows, engaged with activist punk and, ac and academic circles. This physical and visual presence at events as well as the distribution of feminist materials promoted the anti-oppressive ideas we collectively held, though it could have been considered the most passive action to take as a group. In our more active role, the collective's curation of cultural events like The Big Shebang, a film screening of Afropunk, uh, which is a great documentary if anyone hasn't seen it, and various benefit concerts highlighted specific topics to generate discussion both within and outside of our immediate community. Organizing these events was an intentional construction of feminist spaces where alternative notions of community support, accountability, activist tactics, and resources, among other topics, could be discussed. For the Birds has also contributed to feminist visual culture through art exhibits. Visual art was an imperative part of the each big shebang festival going as far back as the Long Island Women's Collective, a show, a show that was curated for every installment. In For the Birds, we continue to insist on featuring a range of feminist-minded artists presenting both fine artwork and posters with messages about or from our community. Um, so essentially here, um, Lauren and I branched off from just doing the full active, um, you know, just we moved on from activism into fully taking on a fine art agenda. And Lauren and I began curating shows, but they included all of these different facets like um, workshops, panels with the artists, and information, um, and our distro, which, as I already mentioned, had music, printed matter, etc. cetera. Um, one last point that I did want to make is that not only do these acts of curation constitute feminist identity for us, but it also has to do within the meet maintenance of the collective. We're a consensus-based collective. We implemented different tactics like check-ins and check-outs, um, making sure that everyone came to the meeting and were able to clear their head and really be present with the work um, and to let go and really um, dive in to the work that we had to do interpersonally. Um, that also involved taking time separately from our group meetings to specifically address race and privilege um, and various other oppressions, as well as just generally making sure that everyone was able to check in about um, the interpersonal work that was happening within the collective. So I hope that, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too much information. Um, 
and thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just interrupting for a moment. If you have your coat on a chair or any of your other things on a chair beside you, please check it. Because as you can see, we're starting to fill up and we need the seats uh, available for anyone who might want to sit. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. I'm sorry we rushed you, but uh, I might we'll keep. How are we going to do the case? <laughs> Give you a. Uh, it's also a problem. It's just. I, I feel. We have an honorous of code. Okay, no, I, I want to say it's that. It's time for questions. Thank you. No, no, I, w I want to make a remark first. I want to say the way we, ended, we went back to art and uh, foregrounded a little bit the issues uh, that emerged when. Curating becomes activism, activism differ, uh, wants, uh, engages curating, and that difficult relationship that it might have. So I really appreciated the way, uh, Kate, you end up again with your exhibitions, bringing us in the, back to the challenging role uh, and the challenging and challenge relation of curating and uh, activism um, and art. Uh, but uh, with this, I would like you to ask questions to our panelists, unless we have to make also an urgent remark from the panelists. But let's start with a question, and preferably with questions that I think at this point maybe could be answered by all of our speakers. Please. Yes, please wait for the mic if you have a question. There is a mic? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> and give this questions? One. Questions, Anyone? please? Comments? No questions? Okay, then we might have questions in bit between us or uh, comments. Maura, I saw your notes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to have some questions, but uh, um, no, my uh, <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> Are people really sitting in these reserved seats? Because that <laughs> seems like there's people that could sit down. I don't know. There are seats. <laughs> oh, I don't want a seat. <laughs> yeah, pe let's just let people sit right now. I mean, it's crazy. Guys, so if we don't have whatever. questions, I, uh, I might ask what do you Collaboration do? people, collaborate with each other. Let people people, sit. Yes. We saw today uh, different ways that. Maybe we need a break. <laughs> Maybe we, should, we need to wrap it up. <laughs> I just yeah, wrap it up. That Hurry up. up. Okay. Nobody wants we to We have talk. a question. <laughs> oh, do we have a mic over here? Where's the question? It's so patriarchal in here feeling right now. Sorry to say. <laughs> I, a man is telling me when to stop talking. Nobody's allowed to sit. Like, what's going on, people? We're in transition. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh. Hey. Hi. Um, so the, the all the language use is like uh, there needs to be a shout out to uh, Mary Daly and her Wicked area. I mean, is that is it part of your heritage? Sure. Yeah, Mary Daly. Shout out. <laughs> Round of applause for Mary Daly. Anyone else? I wish she was here with comments? us. Uh, no questions? Come on. Okay. I want to ask Steiner, now that uh, th her work is in a museum, does this change? Uh, That's this a good thing question. to the capitalist? Uh, okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Speaking of capitalism. Well, for instance, um, when Kelly Schindler, who um, was the curator who worked with, who brought the show to, first to St. Louis and then kind of got it another gig in, in Philadelphia, <laughs> Um, and she was amazing to work with and she wrote this wall text and it was really nice and sweet and then we came in and we had them put it up and then we changed it all on the wall and because um, they, they said we were for equality and you know they were just whatever doing their museum thing and we were like no we're for lesbian supremacy and so we, we kind of 
changed everything. Um, and so I don't know. I find I find that yeah, it's a complicated you know partnership, but yet um, there were so many things we wanted to say in that space. And what was amazing was they wanted us to. The education department said we'd really like you to do a workshop uh, with the Angry Letters Show, and we said okay, great. What we would like to do is have a space where um, people can compose angry les lesbian feminist tomes of their own choosing, and they said. Oh, no, we'll, we just wanted to let people write angry letters. And we said, well, we're not interested in people's anger because we already get enough of that. Um, so it has to be directed as lesbian feminist anger. And they said, never mind. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so there was no workshop. <laughs> End of story. Um, and so the, 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 the working with a museum is just as interesting as working anywhere else, I think, for us. But. Yes, I guess uh, the question also had to do with how the framework of that museum is being challenged or, uh, or not challenged by curatorial practice that engage collaboration, how, how that relates. And I don't know, Maura, maybe you have something to say about that too, because I know that the must, uh, as much as acclaimed global feminists had been, has been also criticized, I guess, all the major blockbuster feminist exhibitions of mm -hmm. that era that sparked the discussion, I guess, we had today. Anything towards that? And how collaborat collaboration actually further can help mm. occupying the, the institution? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I was uh, saying, because the institutionalization of curating in and of itself sure. has become a, pro a problem, uh, cr yeah. can criticize, and how the very col the collective effort and collaboration mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. in creating somehow yeah. uh, opens up doors or not. Well, I, I mean, within I think the institution, though, I think the key for me in working collaboratively and collectively, which is how pretty much I think ninety percent of my projects are, is my attempt to really enact a a kind of feminist curatorial strategy, which is to say that there's a non hierarchical um, approach to curating where you're sort of leveling hierarchies. Um, and so it's a dialogue versus a monologue. Um, so for me, that's just something that I'm particularly interested in and found to be very effective. Yeah. Yes, well, we hope it is effective, but the mellow and uh, <coughs> sweet view of collaboration today with Steiner uh, gets to be a little uh, sour. <laughs> But uh, this is the pur uh, purpose to talk about the merit, but also the challenges. And maybe now uh, the actual collectives can tell us a little bit more about that relationship of uh, activism, curating, and feminist art yeah. and in their practice. And I know, um, uh, Joris, that uh, the residency is, is related to Gaia, and, and that may be something you can also discuss a little bit more about the safety of the space of Gaia, that um, where um, collaboration actually tries to create. Yeah, uh, so, okay, lots of parts of that question. But um, just as far as the, our relationship to sort of institution, I think Meredith and I have been talking about this a lot, especially in preparation for this panel, um, you know, that we, the mission of Gaia and sort of like, you know, our 23-year-old our selves um, were very much about, you know, the, the capitalism and sort of like existing outside and kind of making our own models um, and not really like caring much at all about the things that were important to the institution. Um, you know, mostly mostly money um, because we didn't have any, so it was very easy to do that. Um, and I think that um, you know, as we get older and sort of the the academies become more important in our careers, and and um, curatorial sort of expectation is different from the institutions onto us. Um, you know, we've had to debate that a lot. You know, how much mm -hmm. do we really want to enter? Um, how much do we want to formalize? And how much can we concede? to the things that are important to institutions, which oftentimes we like could give a shit about, right? Um, so I think it's, it's kind of a struggle. Um, you know, you want to enter um, and sort of uh, be recorded in that way that the institutions are very good at doing, documenting, archiving, um, thinking uh, about the larger conversations about feminism um, and art history. Um, and at the same time, you just kind of want to like give them the middle finger and say like, we can do our own things. Um, and you know we can raise money and, and we can crowdsource and we can sort of uh, concentrate on the things that we care about. But I think it is a struggle, of course, because um, you want to make change at the institution. 
So you want to say, like, we exist outside, but we also want you to acknowledge us and change us, um, except that, you know, when you write the wrong wall text, we'll change it, right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of thing. Or we won't have a workshop that we don't want to have. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, we, we struggle with those things as well. Um, and, and I think that that's kind of part of the collective is that we can kind of, like, go back into our own safe spaces and say, you know, we don't have to go there. Um, I think when you're a lone artist, you, auto, you, you end up there because you don't have sort of other support structures. And the collective kind of gives you, um, you know, here we still have this safe space and this, uh, you know, pool of resources in each other mm -hmm. that, um, that maybe we can kind of elect how much of the academic institution and the, and the exhibition institutions that we want to sort of engage. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, should I save my question to Kate? Uh, Privately, or do we not? And we're out of time, right? Okay. Well, okay. Uh, Kate, I feel very sorry because you, you, you left the artistic <laughs> part towards the end, but I guess it's uh, the artistic, the curatorial part in that collaborative activism, it's also, it has its own fraught relation with activist curating. Uh, but we will have to take up the conversation, I guess, outside the room later and move on with the next of the panels. Thank you all for the wonderful talks. I think they completed the diversity.